let me start the recording. Let's see. I think we are. Yeah, we are recording. Let me get my uh, don't bother me classes in progress sign on my door and then we'll get started. As I'm going through or as I'm doing this, just a couple quick announcements. One of the things I decided to go ahead and put on today's lectures or lecture slide was our schedule coming up because we have a celebration coming up in the not too distant future. Um, we will have our first exam in here on Wednesday, October 7th. Uh, remember, though, uh, if you've had me before, you know, we don't have uh, exams in college. We have celebrations of learning. Um, and we'll be celebrating on Wednesday, October 7th. Monday, October 5th, um, we do exam review. And so what that means is I, uh, I will spend like five or ten minutes talking about the logistics of the exam. It might take a bit longer because of how we're doing class this semester with it being online. Um, but I'll go through, you know, what to expect on the exam. Um, you know, the, the format, the logistics, uh, what topics are covered. And then the rest of the time is just you asking questions. We can talk about homework questions. We can talk about problems that we've done in class, concepts, what have you. So all I would say is just be prepared for Monday, October 5th to ask questions. I know that's a little bit uh, a ways away, uh, but it's something to think about. Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to continue our discussion of shear and moment diagrams. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at triangular loads today uh, and how we can use Excel to plot shear and moment diagrams and to verify our results that we're going to do today. So it's going to be one big, you know, uh, hoopla today, all focused on on a given uh, exercise. And I think you'll find it's pretty neat. Uh, just um, Monday. Sorry. Yes. Well, yes. I'm assuming on the exam is that we're going to submit this on Blackboard and we're going to give them, what, two to three hours to submit it, correct? Uh, well, well, we'll talk about the logistics as we as we get closer, but usually what I do, this is what I did in statics and it worked pretty well, is the, the exam itself was timed. It was an hour long exam, but then you were able to upload your scratch calcs a little bit later. So I wanted the exam experience to be timed, but I didn't want you to freak out, oh, I've got to get the, the PDF submitted now. Like. Um, so the exam would be like from 10 to 11, but then, you know, you just have to submit your scan PDF by, uh, by noon or so. And that, that tended to work out pretty well. Um, the class did, did, did very well uh, as a whole. Did that answer the question? Yes. Okay. And, and think about those questions coming up. Uh, Cause like I said, what I, what I did in statics is we had like five or 10 minutes just talking about the logistics, like what you're allowed to use, um, you know, what type of questions they'll be on the exam. Like we went through all of that in, in pretty, uh, pretty big detail uh, there. And I'm a pretty easy guy to get along with, 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 uh, with stuff like that too. Uh, but think about those questions as we, uh, uh, as we get closer to the exam. Monday, what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, concentrated moments um, because that changes a little bit how you go from your shear diagram to your moment diagram. And with that comes cantilever beams. On Wednesday, we're going to uh, sort of tie everything together with internal hinges. Um, uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about shear and moment diagrams for frames on Wednesday. I'm actually not going to put that on the exam because there's not really anything uh, different conceptually. If you can draw a shear and moment diagram for a beam, you could draw a shear and moment diagram for a frame. It's just over. What, what is that? What is, I didn't draw that. Did I draw that? I'm going to erase that. All right. Um, Friday, we're going to begin our discussion of deflections, and that'll be principle of virtual work. And I, I'm a little flu. I, I don't quite know uh, how long hinges and frames are going to take, so that might bleed a little bit into Friday. But once we get finished with the exam, I want to jump into deflections. Um, okay. Let's just jump right into it. Um, so uh, I've got the same two slides that I've put uh, in, in the past couple of lectures, you know, our relationship between load, shear, and moment. Um, uh, you know, the idea that we can integrate our load diagram to get the shear diagram, and we can integrate the shear diagram to get the load diagram. And we have our um, uh, conclusions that we can make for our graphical approach. Now, remember that when we derived our, um, our graphical approach, like when we derived these uh, characteristic expressions, you know, the derivative and integral relationship between load, shear, and moment, we used a sort of a variable distributed load uh, uh, to, to come up with these relationships. And, and because of that, those relationships are going to hold true for, uh, you know, any load. Uh, and, and they hold true for a triangular load just as they hold true for a distributed load. 
the theory works. The problem is, is that while the theory works, in practice, triangular loads are going to present a little bit of a problem, okay? Because let's go back to our, our uh, you know, fundamentals. If we have a curve that's a line and we take an integral of that, uh, we get a quadratic, we get a, a parabola. And if we take an integral of that, we're going to get a cubic expression, okay? So our shear diagram is going to be quadratic. And in order to draw the moment diagram, we have to take the area under the shear diagram. And that's a problem. Because up until now, we've been dealing with rectangles and triangles and trapezoids, stuff that we can determine the area of quite easily. Well, we're really going to have a situation here where we can't do that. We can't determine the area under a, a parabolic region easily without calculus. Now, that doesn't mean we have to break out the derivatives and integrals. We can, we can still draw the shear diagram and the moment diagram without that. Um, what we have to do is break out our secret weapon of structural engineering, though. We have to break out our samurai sword or lightsaber, and we have to cut a section, okay? So we're still going to employ the same principles, and we're still going to follow the same pattern, but we've got to use a couple additional tools to make this easy, I guess you could say. Um, now, we're going to also have a geometry problem pop up this time as well. So this is going to be a little bit of a different problem than what we dealt with last time, but it's just as important to kind of cover this first. Remember last time we had a linear shear diagram, and so we had two triangles, and we had to come up with, a, like, well, what's a simple way of determining these areas, okay? This problem's a little different, okay? So what we're going to be doing is we have a triangular load, and we're going to be cutting a section. We're going to be using our samurai sword or lightsaber, and so... If the entire, let, and I just made these numbers up. Let's say that we have a beam that's 35 foot long and it's subjected to a triangular load that goes up to four kips per foot, okay? So, you know, the, the, the height of the triangular load is four kips per foot and then the beam's 35 foot long. Well, I'm gonna be cutting a section at some arbitrary distance X, right? Because ultimately what we're gonna do today is we're gonna determine a shear and moment function as a function of X. Um, so the idea is, okay, if I have this triangular load, how do I express this concentrated force in terms of X? How do I express this distance in terms of X? And that's going to matter because we're going to need to draw the, uh, a shear and moment expression, so we're going to need these in terms of X. Uh, and so I don't want the geometry to, to mar us up as we, um, as we start doing this example. So I'm going to turn my, uh, my share off real quick, and I have uh, uh, this example sort of drawn here uh, on the board. So I have, uh, you know, a 35 foot long uh, uh, beam and I have a triangular load that has a height up to four kips per foot and I want to determine this, uh, this force and I want to determine the moment arm. The moment arm is pretty easy, but the force is going to take some, some discussion, okay? Now, first off, this force, it, when I say the force, that idealized concentrated load, I'm really only, I'm talking about the area of this triangle. So... I propose that F equals the area of the triangle, which is going to be, I mean, how do you determine the area of a triangle? It's one half base, the base of the triangle times the height. Okay. Now the question becomes, what's the height? Okay. Well, I propose that the easiest way to determine the height is to just use uh, your slope ratios. Okay. So I propose that um, four is to 35 as h is to x and you're like whoa dr mike you just sort of threw that out there how did you come up with that i'm just using the slope ratios i propose that the height of the whole triangle is to the width of the entire triangle as the height of the tiny triangle is the width is to the width of the tiny triangle so just you know rise over run is to rise over run i'm just using this uh, the, the recognition that the slope is consistent throughout. So I propose then that that uh, the height is going to be just multiply the x over 4x over 35. And so if you've got that, then what that means is your force, this concentrated load, is one half base times height or what is that you know those can cancel and so i get like 
2x squared over 35. Is, is everybody with me on that? And then if you're if you're with me on that, you know, that's going to be my force. Let's just make sure everybody's paying attention. Um, what is the moment arm? In other words, if this distance is x, how far is it from here to where I place that concentrated load? What is d? Well, it's not two thirds x because two thirds would be from this end. Like so, the way I have drawn d, I have drawn a uh, d drawn from the big end, so d would be one third x. And it'd be two thirds x if we were talking about this distance, but this distance we're talking about one third. Does that make sense? For those of you that responded two thirds, I want to make sure that makes sense. All right, good deal. Okay, so everybody, everybody with me on this so far? Okay. All right, let me go back to the, the slides. Because I want to look at this example. Okay, so this is the example that we're going to do in class today. And um, so what I have, I have a beam that's 30 foot long. And I have, uh, I have, you know, my reactions. I'm going to say they're unknown. I'm, I want to do this problem start to finish, okay? So we're going to solve the reactions. Um, the, the beam's 30 foot long, and it has a linearly distributed load up to two kips per foot. Uh, and so we need to determine the reaction at A, the reaction at B, and then plot our shear and moment diagrams. Okay. Let me go ahead and get some of this stuff out of the way. And we will, um, well, I actually kind of need the mouse. <laughs> Uh, let me pull up my notebook here. Let's see, share the screen. Okay. So let me draw that full screen. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's do some idealization here. Um, now, I've got this, um, this triangular load here. Let's see if I can simplify that a bit. First off, if I take that uh, triangular load, I can idealize that into a single point load. Can somebody tell me how much that point load is? Like, what is this, this uh, force right here? Now, we're not doing the, uh, the, the cutting a section yet. This is just looking at the beam as is. 30 kip. Okay, somebody said 60 kips, but uh, whoever said 30, the 30 is correct because you got to uh, remember it's a triangle, so you got to cut it in half, right? So it's one half, two kips per foot times 30 feet. That's that's an easy thing to do to say 60. I, I've done that myself, you know, just all oh, at 60. Uh, but yeah, that's 30 kips. Now, I want to issue a word of warning. That 30 kips is only for computing the reactions, okay? It does not hold true when we cut a section. We determined this before when we looked at distributed loads. The same thing is true now. So when we cut a section, we're going to have to come up with a new load. So just uh, just keep that in mind. And let's uh, let somebody help me out. What is this distance right here? 20 feet. There you go. Exactly right. This is 20 feet. And the other side, the other side's 10 feet. Okay. So if I sum moments at A, here, I'll do this over here. I'll do this to the, uh, do this to the right. Okay, so this is pretty simple because if I sum moments at A, I've just got 30 kips times 20 feet equals BY times 30 feet. Like there's nothing else there. So I can shorten that up a bit. So 600 foot kips equals BY times 30 feet. So BY is positive 20 kips, 20 kips upwards. And then if I sum forces in the Y direction, I mean, I think that you could probably just look at this from observation that if I've got 30 down and this is 20 kips going up, 
then this has to be 10 kips going up. I, I mean, I can be formal if you'd like, but I'm fine at this point to just say, look, sum of forces in the y direction equals zero. We know that AY is 10 kips going up. All right. I did that a little quick, but I want to make sure that makes sense. Anybody have any questions on this? Okay. Now, um, I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and try and draw the shear diagram and draw the moment diagram. But in order to do that, uh, well, so first off, let's let's erase this uh, 30 kips and let's erase that. R remember, that was a construct that we created to make the react computation easier. But it is not what's really going on on the structure. What's really going on on the structure is this triangular load. So let's let's see let's see if we can construct this sort of qualitatively, if you will. So we've got, you know, this whole thing going on. This whole thing going on. Let's let's start off with the shear diagram. Now, okay. Now. One of the things I can tell you for sure is that we are going to start and end at zero. That's not going to be an issue, okay? So we're going to start at zero, and then we're going to end at zero over at the other end. Now, everybody watch, uh, uh, follow along with me, and let's see if you're, you're, you're following this. Okay, so what do we know? Well, we start at zero, and we jump up to 10, okay? Now... What do we do for the rest of the beam? Well, before we start talking about shape, let's just talk about the numbers, okay? Now, like we said, there's a total amount of 30 kips of force on the beam, okay? So I propose that if we start at 10 and we drop 30, that over here, we need to be at negative 20. So, you know, right at this side of the beam, we need to be at negative 20. And then that reaction at B is going to jump us back up to zero. So, so that's not going to be an issue, okay? The question is, how do we get there? How, what does it look like in between, okay? Well, this is where the, the uh, calculus relationship comes into play. This is where that relationship between derivatives and integrals matter, okay? What does the load look like? Okay, this load is linear, okay? So if I take the integral of a line, I'm going to get a quadratic, okay? Now, what else do I know? I know this is zero slope. I know that this is going to reference high slope because remember, Zero load means zero slope on the shear diagram. High load means high slope on the shear diagram. So how do I draw a parabola that has zero slope here, but has a high slope here? Well, I propose it looks something like this. Something like that. And so that's going to be what your shear diagram looks like. I'm not saying that that uh, that this is you know dimensionally accurate. That's about what it's going to look like. We're going to have a positive area here, a negative area here. Now, this is going to be a little wild, so bear with me. Um, but if I were to ask you what this distance is, I bet that just about everybody in this class would say something like 20 feet. And what if I told you it's not 20 feet? It's close to 20 feet, but it's not. This is the point at which the shear equals zero. So the shear is gonna be represented by a parabola. So it's not as simple as just, oh, it's where the centroid is. Uh, and you're gonna see why uh, here in a second. But we'll, we'll handle that part a little bit later. Now, 
The problem is, is look, okay, if all we were trying to do was draw the shear diagram, we're done. Like we don't need to do anything else because there's the shear diagram. But ultimately, we not only want the shear diagram, we want the moment diagram as well. Okay, so that's where we're going to have a problem. Okay. So this is the moment diagram. All right, so we start at zero and end at zero. But what does the moment diagram look like? Well, I've got a positive area on the left and a negative area on the right. So what that means is that I'm gonna jump up some point here, like I'm gonna you know, increase and then decrease, but I have really no idea, like I don't know what this value is because that value is equal to whatever that area is. I don't know how the area is under the shear diagram. It's a weird parallel shape. It's not a rectangle or a triangle. I have no idea what that area is. I have no idea what this area is. I know from statics, those two areas better have the same magnitude. I don't know what they, uh, what they in fact are. Okay. Um, before I draw this, was there a question? Uh, yes. Uh, it's about the problem here. It's in theory, can we split it into simple shapes and then determine the area from that? Well, you could, but you're not going to be, when you say simple shapes, are you talking about rectangles and triangles? Well, I, from the area that's above in the positive, I can see look what looks like a quarter circle. And well, uh, Right there, right there. You're saying it's a circle. It's not a circle. It's a parabola, and that's different. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the issue. Okay, um, so you're gonna see. So we've got uh, questions on on integration and the triangle, but you're gonna see how we handle this. And uh, to answer Mr. Enot and Mr. Bauer, it's kind of both, uh, but you'll you'll see here in a second. Just just bear with me. Now, let me say this. I do want to kind of get an idea of what the shear or the moment diagram will look like. And I propose that it's going to look something like this. Like it's going to curve up like this and it's going to curve down like that. Something like this. Okay. And the reason I say that is because remember, this is a high shear. This is zero shear. This is a, a low shear. So we're going to have you know, a high slope, zero slope, and a, a negative slope there. So it's going to look something like this, but I propose that this is quadratic and this is cubic. And so determining these values are going to be kind of difficult without some sort of function. Now, the question about integration, um, I've got sort of a shortcut around that. I've got a way around doing the integration. And the triangle method, we're going to be using areas of triangles, but it's going to be more akin to what we did today than what we did Wednesday. Just bear with me. I want, I want to show you something. Okay. Let's take this, this beam here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to samurai sword or lightsaber through the beam at some distance X. Okay, so let's let's fast forward a little bit. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, so cut a section at X. And we're going to look to the left. Um, this will become much more important later uh, when we start doing deflections. But let me say this, whenever you're cutting a section, always look towards your coordinate system. There's no theoretical reason why you have to always look towards your coordinate system. But from a practical standpoint, your algebra becomes much easier if you look towards the, the origin. Just trust me on that. I, I promise you. All right. So here's the beam. Here's the boundary condition. We have a reaction here. This is AY is 10 kips. And we're cutting a, disc, a section. This is, this is my 
section cut. This dimension is X. Okay. Now, when we, uh, whenever we cut an unknown section, remember we have an unknown shear and an unknown moment. And remember, I'm drawing those according to their positive sign convention. Remember, that's important that you always draw those the right way. That, that's always drawn positive. Okay. All right. And now we have our triangular load. Now, let's see. So here's our triangular load. Okay. Now, this point right here is not, like if you say, oh, that's two kips per foot, that is wrong, okay? Because two kips per foot is the height over at the very, very, very end, over right here, okay? I'm talking about the height right there. I'm talking about the height right here, okay? So this, this height, I'm just going to call H. We got to figure out what that height is. Okay. And wouldn't, again, I'm going to use. Wouldn't the height be a force value and not a, um, a force over a distance? Because a force over a it distance is the slope. You're, you're exactly, the height will be like kips per foot. You're exactly right. Well, I'm saying You'll, I, I thought the height would be kips only. No, 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 no. So, so, so look at it this way. Okay. This dimension is 30 feet. And if that's 30 feet, I'm saying that height is two kips per foot. The entire area of the triangle is in kips. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm saying what, what we've done is cut out a small slice of that triangle, and I'm saying this dimension is X, and I'm trying to determine what, height, what the height is. When we compute the area, the area will be the total force, and that will be expressed in kips. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good deal. All right. So the reason why we needed that, uh, the reason why we need this height is because ultimately, like I said, I want to determine a force and I want to determine this moment arm D right here. Okay. I want to determine this D value. Okay. Now let's start off with the height. Okay, now I propose we can use the same process here on the board that we do here, that two kips per foot is to 30 feet as some height is to my distance X, because I want everything in terms of X. I don't want to see any H's or anything. I just want to see X when it's all said and done. So I propose then that the height is 2x over 30. And if you want to write, you can write it as x over 15. Now, if that's a little confusing, just, just bear with me for a second, okay? Um, the height is x over 15, or 2x over 30. What happens if I plug in x equals 0? What do I get? I get 0. Isn't that the height right here? There's no height at 0. What happens if I plug in X equals 30? What is X over 15? It's two. That's the height right here, okay? So all I'm doing is I'm expressing the height of that triangle as a function of X. That's it, and it's just a line. It's just X over 15, all right? So I propose then that the total force or the area under that triangle is one half X times height or one half X times X over 15, which is X squared 30. And the units for that are going to be kips. They're gonna be, that's a force, 
okay? Now, if you know that, the D value, the distance is X over three, the same as we figured this out over here. Okay, now I don't wanna rush through this. I wanna make sure this makes sense. Is everybody good with me so far? So the area equals the force and the slope equals the height. Um, well, what I would say is this, that the height equals X over 15 or 1 15th X. And I'm saying that that is the slope, that the slope is 1 15th. So sort of. I guess would be my best uh, way of answering that. Does that make sense? Good deal. All right, you're gonna like this, watch this. Okay, let's look at our free body diagram. Let's look at this, okay? Now, I wanna sum forces in the Y direction. So bear with me, okay? Let's just treat this like an equilibrium problem. What do I have? I've got AY is 10 kips going up. And for the sake of discussion, like we can leave the units on if we want, but I'll be honest, when I kind of write functions, I tend to be a bit loose with the units because everything's consistent. I've got all the forces of kip, I've got all the forces of feet. Sometimes I leave that off just because I think it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. So just trust me that the, the forces are in kips and the distances are in feet. Okay, so I've got 10 going up. What do I have going down? I have F going down, which is X squared over 30, and I've got V going down. Does everybody see that? Because what do I have? I got, you know, the 10 going up, the F going down, and the V going down. Those are the only things I have going up and down. And then remember, that F is just, the, all that is is simplifying that triangle. So, if I erase my V. So if I uh, scroll down a bit, what do I have? I have 10 equals V plus X squared over 30. So V equals 10 minus X squared over 30. Now, let's sum moments at the cut. All right, I've got this 10 kips. What's the moment arm for the 10 kips? I want some contribution to the chat. How, what's this moment arm? How is far it, is it from the 10? Is it X? It is X, that's exactly right. It's X units from the 10 kips over to the section cut. And then I have F times D going this way, which is x squared over 30 times x over 3, and then I have my moment, right? Because I don't count the shear because I'm summing moments at the cut. And so I have m equals, or sorry, let, I, I'm skipping ahead. So I have 10x equals m plus, and what is that? So I've got x squared over 30 times x over 3, so maybe x cubed over 90. So m equals equals that. Everybody with me so far? Now, can anybody look at these expressions and tell me is there something that you notice? Uh, if we multiply, basically, if we multiply by the distance of the value of x, there will be equal, v will equal m. No, not necessarily, because the, one's 30 and one's 90. Oh, wait a minute. How about mm. this? How about this?
What's the derivative of the moment? B, or I think, no, I know it's derivative. Yeah, it it's maybe. the shear. What's the derivative? It's the shear. What's the derivative of 10x? It's 10. What's the derivative of x cubed over 90? Well, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So 3x squared over 90 is x squared over 30. The derivative of the moment is the shear. It's a check. So, so Mr. Enoch, you mentioned something about uh, uh, quadratic and cubic, and you also mentioned integration. One of the, the way I wanted to respond to that is that the calculus will serve as a check for what we do later. And so one of the ways that you can check your answer is that the derivative of the moment has to equal the shear or vice versa. You can integrate. I don't like doing it the other way because integration implies you know, there's an integral of the function, it's the answer plus C. And so you have to figure out the C, but when you differentiate, you don't have to about that. But does everybody see that? So I want to show you all something. So, so watch this. Okay, so we have that the shear is 10 minus x squared over 30, and we have that the moment is 10x minus x cubed over 90. Okay, so what? Who cares? Here's why we care. Let me see something. Let's look at some Excel. Watch this. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create three columns. And I'm going to use these expressions here to evaluate this. Now, if you remember, this beam was 30 foot long. So what I'm going to do is 0, 1, 2, or two, whoops, 2, 3. And I'm going to drag that all the way down until we fill that up to 30. So if you all remember in Excel land, you can grab that... Um, that little corner on the cell and just drag that down. And so boom, we fill that up to, uh, uh, to 30. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use these equations to compute the shears, okay? So, and, and the moments respectively. So what do we have? We have equals, and then that's 10 minus, and then it's x squared over 30, so that squared over 30. And then what you can do to, to, to be quick, you can put your cursor on that bottom left corner and then just double click and boom, it fills it in. Uh, now let's look at the shear diagram. What do we start at? We start at 10 kips and we scroll all the way down and we end up at minus 20. Well, what did the shear diagram look like here? We started at 10, we ended up at minus 20. How about the moment? 10 times x minus x cubed over 90. Boom. Now, before we start making some conclusions, let's do some plotting. Let's see if y'all remember how to do this. So we go to insert. And we're going to insert a chart. We're going to do a scatter chart. So we're going to do x, y. And uh, I'm going to use this curved one. It doesn't really matter. Um, actually, let me let me not do that because I don't want it to do it automatically for me. Okay. So now what we need to do is we need to select the data. Let me move this plot over here so I can see a little bit. So select the data. I'm going for my x coordinates. I'm going to use all of these. 
Now let's do the shear diagram first. So for the shear diagram, it's going to be the Y's. Boom. There's my shear diagram. All right. Let's pretty this up a bit. Uh, let's add some uh, chart titles. Let's see. Call this the Call that X. Call that the shear. Let's format this axis. So I right click format axis. You all don't necessarily have to do this, but you all can always pause the recording and go with me on this. So, so we'll change our axis from zero to 30. So it actually looks like the, uh, uh, the beam. Uh, so there's the entire beam. Uh, and let's take the labels. Let's make them low, so let's put them down so they're not in the way. All right, and then let's call this shear diagram. Boom, there's the shear diagram. Now, one of the things to notice is that, like, right here, that's where the shear equals zero, okay? And notice how it's not 20 feet. It's something else. It's like... I don't know, 17 feet or something. I don't know. We're we're gonna we're gonna look at that here in a second. Um, but that's the plot for the shear diagram. Now, uh, if you ever do any like mass amount of plotting in Excel, usually what I like to do is get one graph looking the way I want it, and then just copy and paste that entire graph and and just change the data. So I'm gonna copy this and paste it. And, Sort of move this over here. And then what I can do is I can say, I don't want to plot the shear. I want to plot the moment and just drag that over. And boom, there you go. And there's the moment diagram. Boom. Let me, uh, let me close this. I'm going to pretty this up a bit. So let me... Um, Put that there. Put that there. Okay. Zoom out a bit. And there we go. Let me take a sec before we talk about these maximum moments and everything. I want to see, does anybody have any questions about this? And I know some of the Excel might have gone quickly, but I'm talking about the theory, about what they look like. Maybe I'll take this axis and make it kind of darker so you can kind of see the zero a little better. Let's take this, make it darker. There we go. So basically, if we want to find X, we have to use Excel. Not, well, not necessarily, but uh, I want to show you, um, are you talking about, well, hold on. Are you talking about this point right here, the point at which it equals zero? No, you don't have to use Excel, but what I'm what I'm going to show you is how what we do in on paper matches what we do in Excel. So, if you look here, we got a value of like 17 thing. And likewise, if you follow that down, that is where the maximum moment is. So if I can find that point, I can plug that point into the other expression to get the maximum moment. So you don't have to use Excel, but it's a big check for what you're doing. Let's let's take a look at this. So you say, uh, do you know? You're asking, do we have to use Excel? And I'm saying no. Okay. What do we know about that point? This point X that we're trying to figure out. We know that is the point at which shear equals zero. So. Let's go back to this and let's see if we can figure something out. So, somebody's calling my phone. They can wait. Okay. So,
Oh my goodness. Somebody's calling me during class. I'm sorry. Find the point at which shear equals zero. So we have this expression V, which is 10 minus X squared over 30. Okay. So suppose we don't need to break out Excel. What we can do is just set this equal to zero and solve for X. So what happens if we solve for X? So let's take this expression. Let's add the X squared over 30 equals 10. Add that over to the other side. X squared equals 30 times 10, which is 300. So therefore, X is the square root of 300. What is the square root of 300? Somebody help me out in the chat. 17.32, yada, yada. There, yeah. So 17.32 feet. Does that match what we came up with in Excel? I mean, look right here. What did we find? That's the point at which shear equals zero. Okay. Now, if I want to determine, go back to our moment diagram. I want to determine this maximum moment. Remember, I need to determine this maximum moment. Well, we already have a function for M. We know what this equation looks like. It's 10X minus X cubed over 90. So I propose then that M max is just M at X equals 17.32 feet. I mean, doesn't that follow what you do from Calc 1, right? I mean, I have a moment function. I want to determine its maximum. What do I do? Take the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for X, take that value of X, plug it into your original function. That's calc one in a nutshell. Well, isn't that what we did here? Isn't the derivative of moment shear? So we took the shear expression, set it equal to zero, so x, plug that value of x into the moment expression. So remember moment was 10x minus x cubed over 90. So 10x minus x cubed over 90. What do we get for M max? Anybody got a number for me? Anybody out there? Hello? Is my connection failing? Uh, you, I can hear you. Uh, I got, if I did my math right, 169.9 foot kips. You might, you might want to check your calcs. My number came out a little, I got 115.47. Did anybody else get that? Oh, wait. I see where I got my error on. I thought it was squared, not cubed. Sorry about that. No worries. So, now, watch this. Okay, so 115.47. Look at your Excel plot. Okay, so look at this. Okay, so what did we just do? We used not Excel, but math to show that this is X equals 17.32 feet. So we know this dimension here. And then we said, let's plug in X equals 17.32 feet here to get a moment. And what did we just get? We got
115.47. So to ultimately answer Mr. Enoch's question, do you have to use Excel? No, you don't have to use Excel, but Excel serves as a very convenient check that what you did by hand makes sense. And also the plots, they look a lot better. I, my art, art skills are horrible. Um, let me show you something real quick before we call it. Um, I want to show you your homework assignment because this is a little different. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to develop an Excel plot for this. Okay. So I'll go ahead and tell you that the math is a lot easier. Instead of a triangular load, it's a uniformly distributed load. But what I want you to do is develop an Excel spreadsheet to plot the shear and moment diagram for this beam. Okay. If we were to use Excel for homework where we could just snap a picture, well, for this homework, I'm going to say no because I actually want you to submit the Excel spreadsheet. You don't have to snip your, your, uh, your homework. You could just, I want you to submit this, the spreadsheet, okay? So when you go to Blackboard and you upload your homework, for this homework, you're not going to upload a PDF. You're going to upload the Excel spreadsheet. Now, if you have any calcs that you've written, you know, along with this uh, uh, assignment, you can just include those as an image on the spreadsheet or you can upload as a separate PDF. Like you can upload two files when you upload an assignment. So either one works. But I want you to go through this exercise on a problem that's a little easier. Like this problem was pretty tricky. I mean, triangular loads are tricky. Um, so I want you to go through that in Excel for something a bit simpler. Engineers use Excel, so I want you to have a little bit of experience with it. And so as for your plots, um, I want your plots to make sure that they contain labels for the X and Y axes and titles for the plots. Beyond that, I, I, it doesn't need to be anything more neatly formatted than that. But I want you to plot the shear and moment diagram for that beam using Excel. I apologize. I kept you over like two minutes. I apologize. Any, any questions, though, before we call it? No. All right. It's Friday. I wish you all a wonderful weekend. We'll see you on Monday. That's all I've got.